I'm hanging out with my good friend, Stephen Pilkington. We've known each other. Holy cow. Like, is it over a decade now or like right around? I decade? think, I think we're definitely at a decade now. Yes. He is a brilliant real estate mind, uh, hardcore investor. And so I wanted to have him on. I wanted to talk about real estate, his real estate business, real estate investing. But first off, let's talk about like, how did you and I meet back in the day? Yeah. You know, Anton, I distinctly remember meeting you in Gary Keller's mastermind group, which okay. was part of like the top 100 for Keller Williams. And I'm trying to remember if it was connected with, with uh, Jesse Moore at first or who was also a catalyst where it was like, oh, do you know so-and-so? And then it was like, so-and-so Anton is on the other side of the room right now. You should meet Anton. It's always like that in those masterminds where you're like hanging out with someone and they're like, oh, I know a guy that you need to know. Let's go connect right now. Absolutely. And like, I had like a Pacific Northwest connection. I grew up in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and my family had a house on a Whidbey Island forever. And my dad lives like 45 minutes south of you in Stanwood, or I think it's about 45 minutes. Yeah. So then what, to, so that's how we met, you know, how long have you been in real estate and what did you do before real estate? Yeah. Um, so I got my license in February, 2008. And that happened, I transitioned from investment banking. So I graduated college in 2001, but I was actually a licensed stockbroker from 1999, working at a, like a high net worth investment firm. In fact, if you've seen the movie Die Hard, that Nagatomi Plaza building, that's actually the Fox Plaza. And that was my office building for like four <laughs> years. And uh, um, so I was working doing asset management and um, was doing well at it, yet I got wooed away by some good friends of mine where we went out to dinner after bonus time and they were buying $100, $150 bottles of wine. Oh. And then I found out that one of them, their bonus, like Brandon's bonus was like $425,000 that year. And Rob's bonus was like $375,000 that year. And they had a base on top of it. And so then um, they had, their bonuses were more than my, my income was. And so then they wooed me from asset management over to the securitization side. So I was one of the, the people that uh, was turning home loans into bonds and selling them on Wall Street. And I was at ground zero for Countrywide. I was a head analyst on over $65 billion in debt, most of which was purchased from third-party banks, and then we would turn them into loans. And so when all of that was going sideways, I, I was able to meet, meet my, my bride, my amazing wife, uh, out in Los Angeles. And uh, like we got engaged in March 2007. And then in September 2007, like the managing director came to me and was like, all right, Pilk, do you want to be one of the first people out to go find your next opportunity and get like a little severance package? Or do you want to be the last person out and be part of the great bond buyback where we're basically buying back all this bad debt? And I didn't love 14 hour investment banker days. I like more interaction and getting out in the world more. And so uh, I took the opportunity to uh, depart and, and uh, my wife and I had, a, had one of those like, what do we do next moments and kind yeah. of interviewed cities and opportunities. And um, we decided to come to Denver, even though neither of us had been here because her parents had actually retired here. It was their dream to retire here. And it was a blend of, of having four seasons, having a big city, but then not having LA. And um, like, I didn't want to be someplace super, super hot. And I had opportunities in banking, but it was going to involve some, some regional or world travel. And my wife was not interested in that. Julia did not want anything to do with that. And so, uh, so we moved here and I have two good friends, one in Coeur d'Alene and one in Newport Beach who are very successful real estate. Um, guys, and they encouraged me to get into it. And so then I, that's how I got into real estate. When the markets were collapsing and everything was horrible in 2008, that's when I started helping people buy and sell houses. So, so you were, you were a part of the big short. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And, and then you're like, okay, investment banking, adios, I'm out. Um, I'm going to go get into, into real estate. How did that real estate career start? You know, what'd you do next? And then what did it grow into? Because you grew a massive business, uh, pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So it, um, so how it started is I, um, I actually did some research to learn about different companies. At the time, the one that was most in alignment with what I needed, which was training, um, was Keller Williams and um, has some fantastic things. Uh, as you can see from like my sign in the background, I'm, I'm not with Keller Williams anymore, but I still have a very warm spot there. And um, so I started off and I ended up becoming the rookie of the year, um, which was funny because I was 
like quietly going broke. I sold 14 properties my first year, but my net was only like 37 or $38,000 after the cap fees and expenses and such. And, uh, and then that led into, uh, I just kept progressively growing, progressively learning. I was able to use a lot of my uh, financial background to speak to, to clients about the value of investing in real estate. And so I was able to help um, quite a few clients make well into the seven figures or low eight figures in uh, in purchasing and then turning properties over a two to five year period and um, and was able to I, I was I connected with a gentleman named Joe Bogar um, we saw opportunities in partnering up together and so that was in um, 20 early 2012 late 20, 2011 that fast forward 2015 we had the number one team for the state of Colorado um, for Keller Williams um, doing 230 home sales a year and 75 million back when our transaction dollar size was a lot less. Since then, the team's at about 2,400 transactions now since we've started. It's uh, fluxed from just a couple of agents all the way up to like 16, 17 at the peak. Right now, we've got uh, seven agents on the team. And uh, I think I started uh, investing myself, which I would say one of the biggest mistakes that I made uh, during that time frame was I helped a lot of people make a lot of money. And which isn't like bad, but because I was so heavily financially invested in bank stocks, because that's what I knew. And then 2008 happened and I lost like a significant portion of my net worth. And my wife and I had this attitude that we were going to, or mainly me, it wasn't her as much, that we would just keep earning so much more money that it didn't necessarily matter how much we were spending because before you knew it, we were going to be out earning whatever we're spending. And that's just not true. And so we had a lot of debt. We, even though we had been earning really good money, um, like the year before I started real estate, our net combined income was like 300 something thousand dollars in 2007. And, uh, we had like no money to show for it. Uh, we had a lot of cool experiences and, and we didn't even have super fancy cars, but back then we were paying almost three grand a month for rent in LA. Um, and, um, paying a lot of taxes. Um, and so in the beginning I helped a lot of folks purchase a lot of properties, but because mm -hmm. of what happened financially to me, I was too timid to, to go out on a limb for fear of like zeroing out or going negative more. Um, and it took me a handful of years to get confident enough to where then I started um, doing my own investment properties, which was really probably about uh, 2015, 2016, um, really started leaning into that more. So yeah, a little bit of I, a summary there. So. No, I love it. And we're going to go into investment properties next, but I want to stick in traditional real estate for just a second. What are you seeing right now? What are you feeling, you know, in the market? What excites you? What's hard? You know, let's stick mm. through that because, you know, our audience is real estate agents, real estate investors, and mm. I, you get us, you know, you've got the double look here. So I want to go through, you know, what's working, where is it going and what are you seeing first? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So what's working right now is, um, so we, we started a staging company about four years, four or five years ago, and it was all based around our flips actually, because I saw the value in really designing the properties to sell uh, a product that uh, like, you just look at new home builders. Like you never see a new home at a new home build site, just vacant. There's always example stage. So we started doing that and then we started leaning in with our clients to really help them do fit and finish items to make it where their house was as presentation ready as possible. And that has resulted in some very good returns for clients. Like uh, one example early, earlier this year, um, a client that was referred to me, she had expired with another agent at the end of last year. She started at six and a quarter, went down to $599. We came in, we, we helped um, do about $5,000 in, in kind of repair items. Like her and her, her ex-husband had DIY stuff and they had 90% a lot of the job. So we, we were finishing paint trim, we were finishing caulking, things um, just fit and finish. And, and then we also invested in staging and my, our clients got a discount because they used our staging company. So overall, the client was about $8,000 into it, which was money they did not have. So we lent them that money um, for a fixed 15% uh, return uh, on, on the money. And then the side effect was that instead of being at $599, we sold their property for $660. And so- What? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so like with, the, with my data background and the fact like when I was growing up as a kid, we were in middle school when we built our first house. Yeah. And so I've seen the process of like, I've seen what it's like. And my parents like tried to sell that house, not finished and it didn't go so well. Yeah. And then years later, the, the people that bought it finished it and the home sold for double the price, but they wow. did not spend more than like 10% more on, on finishing it. Um, and so what's working well right now is 
really guiding clients so that their property is as there's a story behind it. And then there's as prepared as possible for to maximize what the market's going to allow. And this works in all different ranges. So like we have one that just went active officially last night at uh, just under 2.6 million. We originally talked about going on at around 2.3 to 2.4 at the high. And, but we were able to, I, that this client had the capital to do it. And they, I think they're into it now for about 35, $40,000. And there's a good chance that we're going to have multiple offers by the end of today, even though it's just still in the coming soon status, um, because we've presented it um, for that buyer where they see the vision, um, because we're just teeing it up to them on a silver platter. So that's awesome. So, and I want to, I kind of want to reiterate this. So, are you saying, like, because inventory is really tight in the market and you've got a good stable market, if you go through and you massively clean up the property that you're essentially netting them a higher return each time, whether it's their capital or your capital, am I hearing that correctly? You're hundred percent correct. Cause what's, what's interesting is that we do still have low, relatively low inventory and um, around the Metro area, I use a tool called Altos real estate research. Um, yep. Just get it for free through my title company. I love it. And it has this little meter on like, are you a seller's market balanced or buyer's market? Yeah. And we are seeing areas in the Metro area that are actually falling under buyer's market. Wow. And we're seeing areas that are seller's market and things are just stagnant and they're sitting. And so just diving into some of the details on the ones that are selling, why are they selling? Like what's special about them? Is it the condition, the location, or the price or what combination of it. And while we can't change the location, we can change the condition and the price. And oftentimes people have it, like when somebody comes to me and they tell me like, I really wanna sell my house for this amount of money. Um, my first question back to them is fantastic. Is this amount of money net important enough to you that you're willing to invest the amount of money necessary to get it? Because then they're usually like, what do you mean? I'm just not gonna get that now. It's like, no, like your house is worth something now. If you want more than that, we can get it for you. It just depends on how many dollars do we need to go in. And my goal whenever I guide people is that for every dollar we spend, we should be getting somewhere between three to six dollars back. It's a one to one ratio. Then it's a little more risky than I prefer. Yet sometimes just again to have a finished product, maybe with like carpet or things like that, it can make sense. But yeah, so that's that's in a nutshell, like our market is wonky. Buyers are more picky than they've ever been because yes. mm -hmm. affordability is like still an issue. And, and price means something to people who are cash to everybody else. It's payment. And the price is just a, a, a part of the equation of that payment. And they're not, they may say they're deciding on price, but they're deciding on that monthly payment. So well said, bro. Well said. Uh, so that's what's working. What's not working or what struggles are you seeing? And then what are you guys doing to adapt, you know, improvise and overcome there? Oof. Condos right now. So condos are a real challenge right now. So Denver is a, is a hail area. Like with our high altitude, it can be really warm and sunny. And then you see these big dark clouds come in and then, and then you get hail that sometimes comes in the form of like golf balls, sometimes in softball size. It's rare, but it happens. The side effect of that is that with the hail that's happened, and then I think it was two or three years ago now, there was a, a significant fire that happened up near Boulder, Colorado. And it was in January. It just happened to be really windy and dry. And some power lines, some trees fell on power lines, sparked them, and it ended up causing over a thousand households to burn down, a lot of which were multifamily, a lot of which were single family. So what we're experiencing, and when I say condos are a challenge, it's not the condo, it's the insurance. We are seeing insurance challenges with single family homes, primarily ones that are a little bit more rural and more mountainous. Um, we're seeing insurance rates any, go anywhere from one to, to three to five times higher than they were because the trees. Uh, and we're having clients that have to saw down every tree within 100 plus feet of their house, which kind of eliminates the benefit of like moving into like golden Colorado or evergreen Colorado when you've got to, when you've literally got to get rid of that. Um, and then the, on with the condos, what's that, what that has meant is that with insurance changes, so almost every condo in Metro Denver, if the roof is over 10 years old, then the insurance will no longer cover full replacement costs. They will cover actual value, which is a depreciated value. And that means that you can no longer get a Fannie or Freddie loan. Um, wow. The other thing that, yeah, which is huge. 
The yeah. other thing that we're seeing is that we are in a uh, um, an environment where insurance companies are essentially requiring buildings to self-insure. And so what they've done is they've increased the deductible for, for catastrophic loss to 5% yep. of the value of the building. And everyone's value has gone up significantly. We have a client who just got hit with this. Like she's owned the property since, since uh, 2001. And she has an HO. And so all of you listening, make sure your clients have HO6 special assessment coverage if they own a property that is a condo or a townhome with shared walls. So my client, her building just got hit with hail. And that means that she is now, and because the building has a 5% deductible, which is the max amount that Fannie and Freddie will allow, 5%. The building has to come up with 5% of the value of the building of 36 or $35 million in, <laughs> before the insurance will pay a dime. And so yeah. each owner is getting hit with essentially 5% of the value of their unit. With, which for her is about $16,000. So a special and assessment so, across all the units, is that what it is? That's exactly what it is. Wow. And so imagine how that might affect your lending when all of a sudden 5% of the value of your building, maybe you're not getting anymore. And now you may have insurance claim that's going to last for months. You now have lenders that they won't lend on buildings with roofs that are over 10 years old. And so we've seen, we've seen some properties, the HOA fee go from 200 a month to over 600 a month because the insurance premium yep. went from 75,000 to 610,000. And we're seeing people um, really get harmed more on this than they are on the single family side. And so when I say what's not working right now, to be frank, I've got a client who he is an investor. He was referred to me from a wholesaler actually, which by the way, all of you out there, whether you love or hate or don't think anything of wholesalers, become friends with them because they can be amazing opportunities for you to find properties that you might want to invest in. And they have clients that are buying, investing and flipping properties. And most wholesalers do not do traditional real estate sales. So this one, this client was referred to me by a wholesaler. He bought a property, bought a condo, renovated it. And the comps last two sales were 384 and 386,000. Pretty tight range. So we list it at 375, thinking we're going to be aggressive. We're now at 350 and it's still crickets. And we're nicer than the other two. Wow. I will say that one caveat is that we are in a unit that is on the border of the complex. So we have more road expo exposure than anyone else. And when the market is picky and tight, it is not the time to expect to get a great return if there's any kind of stigmatizing effect. Yes. Roads, power lines, stuff like that. I just turned down an incredible uh, like duplex flip opportunity because the size of the power lines adjacent to it, it just wasn't worth the risk on that. So what's not working right now is the insurance and, and the condo stuff. So. Yeah. You know, we've talked about insurance before uh, here on the podcast. Insurance is a, it's a massive lagging thing. What happens is the value of everything goes up and then boom, next year, everyone gets the increase. Well, uh, CPI shot up, prices for everyone shot up, bam, everyone got the increase. What's even crazy, my man, is with our little insurance brokerage, I'm not going to, you know, oust the, car the carrier, but I'm just, there's a major carrier that we carry and they literally said, please sell zero more policies this year. We don't want any. And they're mm -hmm. literally trying to deny everything. And then what they're doing is they're going and looking at the aerials. And like you're saying, if trees are near, we're not as bad of a fire hazard here in the Evergreen State, you know, <laughs> north of Seattle. But if they got moss on the roof or something where they're like, nope, we won't insure it. So it's happening to us too. We're seeing the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Shifting gears to continue into this investing side, what are opportunities that you're currently pursuing in real estate investing? You know, What are you looking at right now? Um, so uh, right now, my favorite thing, like I love cash flowing properties, which are a challenge right now. Um, with interest rates, what they are, and being in a city where the average cap rate hovers between four and a half to six and a half percent, it's a challenge to, to make a cash flow when your average loan right now on, on a investment or a commercial is hovering from seven to nine or 10%. Um, so what I do a lot of is I look for value add opportunities, um, usually in some form of a distress situation. Um, so one of our mentors, um, uh, Brett Tanner, who, who you and I are both been connected with, 
um, really educated us a lot on, on stacking your marketing so that you can appeal to people more on, uh, on a potential cash offer, knowing that nine out of 10 folks, they really want a retail sale, but one out of 10, um, there might be a reason where they really do need a cash offer, whether it's a condition, a timing, something like that. And so right now I've got, uh, I've got two flips, one that we just hit the market with, um, and one that we're about 60% of the way through. And my goal is to find single family properties. Um, I'm, my preference is properties that are between like a thousand square feet and about 3000. Um, I, I generally try and shy away from the ones that are six, seven, 8,000, um, unless we are going for a luxury, which like every now and then that does make sense. Um, but I'm looking for things that we can, we can turn it relatively quickly and it's really following or it's falling into the, the top, like 80% of what's selling in the market, which is single family homes in Denver priced from 500,000 to about 900,000 that are in good condition for their neighborhood and priced well for their neighborhood. That's what's still selling because that's, that's the every man house. Um, like I like doing luxury stuff, but I'm a li I'm quite a bit more cautious on it now. Um, because the, the material expense has just gone up so significantly, the labor expense has gone up, the holding cost has gone up. And while there are homes that are trading like incredibly, like, uh, like one of my good friends just listed one of his scrape new builds that was originally going to go on the market for 6 million. And it just hit eight and a half million and they're actually getting a bunch of interest in it. But also the original build was supposed to cost 4 million and ended up costing six and a quarter because the material costs and labor costs. So what I really like right now is those, those single family homes where we can ideally have a three to six week uh, at the longest, like a 10 to 12 week renovation. Like the one I'm doing that is more of a 12 week renovation. We just, we got the structural steel beam in there so we can remove walls because this one, it happens to front to a park. And so instead of having the kitchen and living area facing the backyard, which is like an okay backyard, now it's scooting down and it has full root, full views of this park, which also happens to slope down. And then you see some mountains in the distance and all that. So, Amazing. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm looking for. Like one property um, we were able to acquire directly from an owner, though an agent was involved um, off market and we got it for 390. Um, we spent about 40,000 on it and we're back in the market now at 515. And what I like about this one, it's a buy level, which aren't my favorite, but it has an oversized two car detached garage and a one car attached, which is very appealing to outdoor enthusiasts, to, to mechanics, to people that are the hobbyists. And it's rare for that area. And I really like that. And so I'm looking for things that are like a story to sell it. And the same way that it being in front of a park is a story to sell it, except we also have to be careful to not do showings in open houses during the times that the soccer games are happening when you essentially can't park on any of the area there. So, um, this, yeah, this is a brilliant strategy. So we were selling or flipping when we have a story, when we have something that we can get out there and we can create some type of value. But the really big thing I want people to get here is you are literally, you're de-risking your flip by going for the meat of the market. So if you're in the meat of the market and 80% of that is what's turning over, that's turning over rapidly, your risk, your time horizon, the level of detail you have to go to because that's where all the buyers are is not, you know, it, it's, it's easier, it's quicker versus when you go into the luxury one, like you were saying earlier, your holding costs are up, your material costs are up, your labor costs are up. So your risk is going like this. Dit, 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 dit. And mm -hmm. one more market correction, one negative CPI report, and bam, all of a sudden, you know, that luxury buyer could then pull out of it. What uh, what else you've been doing? You started to mention a multifamily uh, that you were doing in Cleveland and then what you were learning about that one. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and, and actually it kind of compounds on a luxury thing too, because, um, we, my wife and I built our second house in Silverthorne, Colorado, which is kind of a, um, there's like three small mountain towns, um, in Summit County that feed into the ski resorts of, of Keystone, Copper, Breckenridge. It's close to winter park. It's 35 minutes to Vail, 40 minutes to Beaver Creek. So it's right up in like ski town central. But Silverthorne was one where I saw this opportunity um, where it was lower price point than a lot of the other ones around, yet I'd gotten word that the developer who redeveloped a couple major sections of, of Denver was redeveloping the downtown. 
and there happened to be uh, this planned community where it was mountain modern homes. And from a risk perspective, it was about a two year build time or just over two year build time. Um, but we've got, I saw like I, I had helped a couple of clients buy in there. And from the time that we put the price or the deposit down 15% non-refundable deposit, um, to the time they closed on it back in 2017 to 2020, um, they had each got each property had gone up between 250 to $300,000. And so we actually did two properties in there. And the second one was a single family home, um, that we were able to lock up. We picked an amazing lot with amazing views. I was literally out there with my drone trying to figure out where the best view would be based on houses, um, and found a great opportunity, designed it well. And, um, we're into it all in for about 1.9 million. Um, we had about $380,000 tied up for the better part of two years. And then we closed on it last June, spent another like probably $75,000 or a little, no, we closed on it for 1.85, but then we were into it for 1.925 after we spent the 75 grand in landscaping and furnishing it. And then we were able to trade it for 2.5 million, um, which was fantastic. Um, And when you, so it was like, I had about, in all, I had about uh, 400 something thousand dollars of my money into it. And then I was able to 100% gain that money over, but it was over a two year period. Yeah. But then it also created a potential very big tax consequence. Wow. And so um, I've been uh, learning from a lot of other folks. And again, some of our mentors who invest in properties like Brian Gubernick and Ben Kinney are two mentors that I also look to um, that uh, they've invested in quite a few properties in other areas. And one of them was in Cleveland. And I was looking for metrics around the country where I could ideally get above a 10 cap. So my number one criteria is 10 cap or above. Number two criteria is opportunity zone. Yep. And so if I could dump this money into something where I could get the benefits of cost segregation, but then sit on it and, uh, and keep it as a cash flowing building, um, then it's going to make a big tax savings for me, which it, it did. And then uh, ideally you're going to have some good cash flow on it. Um, and then on top of that, there should ideally be some appreciation. What I've discovered is that um, we get used to doing business how it happens in our own backyard. And Denver's a market with 28,000 agents competing for 40 something thousand transactions per year. Um, and every transaction is two sides. So let's say roughly like 80 to 90,000 transaction sides per year are competing with just under 30,000 people. So people really have to be on their game and the vendors have to be on their game. And there's a lot of choices to choose from. What I've discovered, and I reached out to like a brilliant friend of mine, um, Brad Miklovich, and um, he's in Akron, Ohio. And I was like, Brad, who are you using for property management? And he gave me the name of one. And he goes, but I want a caveat with that they suck. And I was just like, excuse me, like, this is the best person you know, and they suck. And I'm like, but you're really like, you've got high standards, you're really picky. And he was like, no, 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 they all suck around here. And I was like, interesting. And he was right. They all kind of do suck compared to property managers that I work with here. The amount of um, um, just how on point they have been, the amount of uh, like follow up, the amount of proactivity that they've been is definitely not what I've been experiencing here in Colorado. I've also experienced a market where the rental is very different. So when you have a property that's uh, that comes available, it might be available a lot longer than it would be available here in, in Denver. And so like one the the biggest unit I have in the, in the five unit building, which is a four bedroom, one bath. Yeah. Um, and it's renovated. It's really nice. It's now been sitting vacant for a handful of months. And uh, I'm now working personally to get like the um, it's like the Cleveland Housing Authority to approve me another like Section 8 person because we can rent it for more. But the property manager won't go through that pro- process for me. Really? And so what I'm discovering is that, yeah, they won't. And um, what I'm discovering is that there's um, if you're going to be investing out of the area, my I'm not opposed to it yet now. I would prefer to be part of something that is run much more like a well-oiled machine, even if that means that I have a little less upside. Um, So investing in um, whether it's syndication or a larger um, piece that has, has people who are boots in the ground that have a financial vested interest with equity, not just a, I'm going to clip a check from you every month, regardless of whether it does well or not. So, so I'm still happy that I made that investment. Yeah, there's a big part of me now that looks back and wishes that I would have looked for something in an opportunity zone more locally where I can have a little bit more control over the quality of what happens. And I also have a little bit better pulse on the market on what's happening. So if that makes sense. One thing you would kind of mention to me too is you're, you're, you're kind of getting a, a mantra of like, 
get rid of the noise, easy oh. to manage, consistent growth. Go through that because that was brilliant the way you said that. I, I want our listeners to hear that. Yeah, you know, it's um, we all got kind of fooled in uh, 2020, 21, in the first half of 22, that we're amazing that like we're hitting banner years, banner profits, like we're selling houses faster, easier. Like I can hire team members on my team and they, the leads convert better. And it was the, 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 the tide rose and everyone did better. And now we're seeing the, the results of what that looks like in a more challenging environment. So the, the reality is, is that a lot of the decisions that I was making to invest, um, I was incent- essentially throwing myself future passes thinking that I was going to be in the same situation that I was in at that time I was thrown the pass, which the time was, is that business was easy and it kept coming in. Well, what's been happening in the last um, really 12 to 18 months is that expenses matter. Um, unit count is down across the metro area and across the, the entirety of the United States right now. Um, we're seeing some of the lowest home sales numbers in, in years. And what that means is that my focus has been so much more on um, making sure the viability of my primary business, which is funding everything else, is makes sense. Which means that if I'm putting a lot of effort in an area that I used to have to put still effort, but less, then now any other outside noise is really becoming a distraction. And the it means that there are times where even though it's costing me personally money by not solving something on an investment side, it's not worth fixing a $200 a month problem and preventing $20,000 of revenue from coming in. And so, and in a perfect world, we all say like we leverage it, we systematize it and all that, which is, that's true. Like in a perfect world that happens yet in reality, it's a step-by-step over time process. And so what I've discovered is that um, noise is real and there is no, as, as much as I wish there was, um, passive real estate investing income um, when you own individual properties. I just don't think that's a reality. Um, I think that there is, it's leveraged passive income, but it's not passive income. And you, there has to be a someone to manage that. And if that someone's not great, then ultimately that responsibility comes back to you. So I've been focusing a lot more on how can I eliminate things that are high noise um, unless there's some reason that that noise, like the dollar per hour value is so worth it that how can I eliminate it? Because even if I take a hit on my potential monthly return on it, if that means that I can then have more focus on what's generating the opportunities for more of these investments anyway, then it's just smart. Um, or at least I think it is. I mean, who knows? We'll see how it all plays out. But, um, but yeah, that's in my world, what's been happening is, um, getting away from all these different passes in different directions and really focusing on how can I continually throw myself future passes that I can catch only they're in alignment and I'm not having to jut off my path of what I'm already doing. It's stacked. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, it, this is, this is a mistake and I'm going to pick on us as men for a second. This is a mistake that as men we make and we believe I'll just outwork it. I'll out hustle it. I'm smarter. Whatever the fallacy is, I'm better looking. You know, I'm smarter than that guy. I make more, whatever. And so we allow like this giant funnel of noise to come into the world. Also, you know, some of us are squirrel chasers, myself included. And so the, all this noise comes in when you're breaking it down to the fundamental of wealth creation and also of even of happiness. The tighter mm-hmm. my day is, the more defined my activities, the easier it is for me to complete them, the easier it is for me to measure my success, and the easier it is for me to be wildly successful. Then I can take my wins, my spoils, and push them over here. But then I have to decide again, what level of activity and management am I going to put into that other one? I love what you're saying. Um, Had a deal uh, come my way. And I looked at it and I was like, oh man, there's a lot of money to be made here. And then I really sat down and I was like, this is going to take me 30 months. Do I really want to be connected to this for 30 months? I don't care how big the return is. 
What level of noise is this going to produce? How much of my time? What am I going to have to sacrifice? And at the end of the day, uh, I just picked up one of my homies and was like, homie, I need you to go buy this. This is a good deal. Um, I'm going to walk away from it. Uh, and they're like, why? And I was like, I don't have the time, but you do. Please purchase this. And so it's it's having that wisdom. And this is where I want to congratulate you, my friend, that and that understanding of like, I don't have to win every race. I've got to win one really well. And then I can make some side bets with, with what's happening. I want to go through, you had talked about, you know, we talked about the ski towns real quick, right? Mm -hmm. And um, is that the one where you also had a really good win and then there was a mistake that you made on the other side? <laughs> yes, yes. Not trying to rub um, on, but this is, this is a good... Once it's going down the same line we were just going down. And so if you're willing to share that, I'd love to hear that. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, Anton. Um, and so the backstory on it is um, the first property I actually built in this development. It was a paired home um, with a purchase price of uh, just under a million dollars. And then after the renovations that we did, we were into it for about 1.2. We, we kept it for over nine months, had some great use of it, which I actually bought and owned that in a Roth IRA. And uh, which meant that there was a tax-free sale. Um, there was some UBIT tax that I had to deal with, uh, which is a whole other story. But we, we saw this as an opportunity that we really wanted to do more of this and we wanted to use the property more. And so, and at the time, because you and I, like we're always like looking for opportunities. We're always got our, our, our fingers in the pulse of the market and different investments out there. <laughs> yes, and sir. it had been the, and this is, uh, uh, I started building this property in, um, I think it was early 20, um, or mid 2018 and then we closed on it in 2020 during covid which was a little scary but then it worked out really well for us um and fast forward we're selling it in 2021 and between 2020 and 2021 was one of the largest wealth accumulators for people in the cryptocurrency arena and i seem to be really good at making friends with people that have like eight nine figure exits on things or or people like fraternity brother who's like yeah man i, I read about this and I thought it made sense and I went on a limb and I put 50 grand down and it turned into $18 million. You're just like, what, like how? And so then I, I started doing a lot of research on, on cryptocurrencies and I did it in a way where I thought I was, um, I was looking to people who in my mind were smarter than me. And some of which were hedge fund people, private equity people, um, really intelligent folks out there. Um, and, uh, and so what happened was, I sold this property and had a very, very big net gain on it and it freed up about a million dollars. And I almost immediately put about um, $600,000 of that back into the markets and cryptocurrency. Here, here's like a, a life lesson. Anything that can go up fast can go down fast. Anytime, like if you're in, a, in an investment where the highest you're going to gain is 5%, well, then you probably have the lowest low of zero or maybe 1% down. But if the highest you can gain is like 200% in a year, well, there's a good chance that that could go down like 80, 90% or 99% um, in a short period of time. And so what happened was um, I invested 600,000 and almost in, in like two months, I was up almost $400,000 on it. Instead, I dumped another $400,000 into it. And then in four or five months, it lost between 70 to 80% like that. And I was even investing some of it in things that were supposed to be more secure. Like um, if you're familiar with Terra Luna or Luna, um, I was putting money in their stable coin that was paying a 20% yield. And so like, if you've got $200,000 in a stable coin marked as a dollar paying a 20% rate of return, that's a fantastic return, except when there's a structured hedge fund attack and the value of that, that was a dollar for the last like four years in a row, goes from a dollar to like 15 cents in a two hour period. <laughs> and um, I was not able to, and this is like, it, it was a domino effect of the worst things that could happen where I had sold some things for a significant gain and then had a big loss that happened. Only like I had a really big gain in 2021, started having and sold some cryptocurrency and had more gain. And then in 2022, I'm having huge losses only now I need to pay taxes on those gains in 2021. Um, and it's like so a double whammy. I, oh, huge double whammy. And, and so, I mean, this led to like, first of all, it led to incredible amount of relational stress with my wife and I. Sure. Because my wife and her wisdom, in which I took as she was not 
investing the time to learn all the things that I learned. Um, I was like, no, honey, like I'm going to prove to you how great this is instead of just following guidance and being like, why don't you just invest like 10% or 20% and not don't go in like 80, 90% of this liquid fund we have. Um, and so um, number one, didn't follow the, uh, the advice of my spouse. And, um, and my vision is this long-term amazing life with my spouse. But in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to get us there. And this might fast track us by five, 10, 15 years. And you're going to thank me so much. Um, not considering the potential downside in, in a reality way. Um, number two, like mentally and emotionally, like going through 2008 and earning money and then having it all drop and then spending time to build back. I mean, that was a hit. And then having that happen again, that's a huge psychological hit. And that's a, um, it's hard to focus on helping somebody buy or sell real estate when you're losing like 10 times the money you're going to make on that just in like a day or two with like what's happening in the market going down. And so it ended up creating a level of noise that started impacting other areas. Um, it then started impacting my opportunities to continue investing in things. Cause now all of a sudden the dry powder I had so much, of it was gone. I mean, luckily I had investments that were already locked up. And so as those were freeing up, it was freeing up more capital. But I mean, that was a huge thing. And ultimately when I look back on it, it's, it's kind of funny that like, um, and I've talked to multiple mentors about this and I've pre been pretty transparent in like different investment groups and mastermind groups about it. Um, and that like, I'll commonly say, I, I feel like I'm one of the most intelligent idiots that I know. Um, and that I might conceptually know these things, but you don't always follow them in the, in the, in the heat of the moment. And, um, it's really pretty wise to look at, like, if you have something that earned 90% of your revenue, but then you're choosing to invest that in something completely different, um, either you better have a really good who with an incredible track record and incredible philosophy you buy into. Otherwise you should really just keep focusing on the thing that is generating you the, the opportunities in the first place. And like, as somebody who, um, I was literally like just one test away from getting my certified financial planner. And I was not following anything about modern portfolio theory and risk adjustments and diversification. Um, because in my mind, I was seeing how the, if it kept up going for just like another six months, then we would have enough capital to be able to pull out and put into some secure other assets that the cash flow of that basically mean we had, we had choice. We had freedom of choice. We could just be like, I'm done. I can just live off this now. My horizontal income is enough to where like I'm paying for hundred percent of my expenses and then some by a margin and I don't need to worry about it. And so it's like seeing this dream and goal caused me to take more risk and front load that. And what it ended up doing was, I mean, who knows how far it set me back, but it definitely set me back. And I had to go back to the drawing room and just like figure out like, what did I want to focus on? Where did I want to go? What is a amount of risk that makes sense? And even like a bigger picture than this. And like, first of all, it took therapy and it still takes therapy. And I believe every one of us um, who's in a, in, a, in a career path like real estate where you have emotional um, baggage that you might be getting from other people, you have team members that you're leading, you're an entrepreneur, and it's not like you can sit and talk to your team members or you shouldn't as a leader about all the <laughs> challenges and internal struggles. And you also shouldn't go home and just dump on your, your spouse uh, uh, what it is. Um, and so having, um, having some real guidance through that, I think really did help me get up and stand up faster. Um, and so I strongly, strongly recommend that. Um, and then, uh, it also really helped me realize that, um, one of my, 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 one of my best coaches ever is a guy named Craig Zuber. Awesome coach. And, um, he said to me dozens of times, Pilk, when your values are clear, decisions are easy. Amen. And in my mind, my values were clear, yet I was holding up one value of having this lifestyle for my family. Yet in the other hand, I was willing to risk whatever I had for my family in order to have this for my family, which is so counterintuitive. Um, and so, so yeah, so looking at all that, it's been, it's been a great education. It's been, and just like you, Anton, like I have rarely encountered a, a financial entrepreneurial opportunity that didn't sound like something that I could just crush and knock out of the park and, and make huge returns on. And the, the curse of the, the brilliant, is, super active individual, active mind. You're like, that sounds good. We can do that. <laughs> yeah. And when you, and when it's, and, and you and I have both been coaches for people and we've been coached by some amazing coaches in the industry. And it's so easy to then start identifying someone else and be like, oh, well, if we just tweak this, this, and this, then we can take you from here to here. And um, where the reality is, is like, 
the people who succeed the most, you're staying in your lane, you're putting more effort towards the things that make the biggest difference. And, um, and uh, like two Dan Sullivan books that I recommend around this, like one's the gap in the game, like constantly focus on what you've accomplished and be proud of that versus having this never ending goalpost. And the other one is uh, 10x is better than 2x. Because like you and I are great examples of how many times have we lived in the 2x world where yeah. we're smart, we're driven, we're just going to work harder, we're going to get up earlier, we're going to work out more, we're going to do this, this, talk, call more people, and then that's going to lead to all this success. And it does lead to success, but it's that 2x success where you're going to kind of burn yourself out at a point um, and uh, wonder why you're performing so at such a high level, but everyone around you isn't um, because you're driving, driving, driving instead of empowering and, and growing and, and doing the systems. So. Brilliant. And I love that you shared that. Thank you. Um, so as you have this setback, as you experience it, you know, you said you got therapy, you got coaching, you, you went and found mentors, but that's brutal, bro. Like what, mm -hmm. what else did you have to do? And was there a point where you're like, you know what, maybe real estate and real estate investing is not for me. I should, Go hunt for greener pastures. I mean, w walk us through a little bit more of that because uh, I know how your brain works and your your problem solving and how you worked through this is its own recipe that could be applied to multiple areas of our lives. Yeah. So like the first thing I'll say about that is that in my mind, um, what I needed to do was double down and figure out ways to expand and grow quicker. <clears throat> and so instead of... Um, but it expanded grow quicker in the things that I knew. And so I, it's funny, I went from being part of one mastermind group to being part of three mastermind groups, but then also having traveling events for my brokerage and for my business partnership with place. And so during the time of the most financial and emotional stress with my spouse, I then in my infinite brilliance decided to lean into more learning and more ways to grow even in the same industry. But now I went from being out of town from like, eight to 10 days a year to being out of town, like 30 to 40 days a year. Um, which means that I was taking myself away from the things that were generating the revenue, taking myself away from my family, which I'm doing all this for. It's like, I cannot tell you the number of times in my mind. And even out loud, I said, I'm doing this for you. It's like, while I like, you're asking me to stay here and just be present, but I'm going to leave and go do something else because it's going to be better for you. Just watch. <laughs> it's, like it's, it's so counterintuitive. And, and we're all guilty of saying this. I mean, I, I understand. Yeah. But the, the side effect of what, and what I didn't realize at the time, which I then got out of a little more coaching and a little more uh, um, uh, counseling is that I was going to events, hearing other people's wins and losses and commiserating because leadership can be very lonely. Um, owning a business can be very lonely when like you and I like can talk about it and connect on it. Cause we have so many similarities and I have a lot of friends around the com or country with very similar yet. It's almost what had happened is I had split myself into this duality of the reality of being at home and the grind of inching and clawing back every little step that I could. And then the flip side of that is like, I'm going to get out of town. I'm going to pay for expensive dinners and go out and live the life of, of being successful because that's the image and that's the, that's what we all want to present. Um, and we would talk about our failures and everyone else would talk about their failures, but it was in a lot more of an encouraging positive environment where it seemed like it was a, um, it was giving me a lot of effort, positive affirmations that were necessary, but I was, again, it was almost like a drug. Uh, and I was, I was neglecting in ways it's like I would come back and then have be energetic for a week or two. And then, a week or two later, I'm like down in dumps and I'm focused, but then I'm going off to the next event, the next event. Um, and so the, the flip side of that though, is that I did learn a lot more about ways of investing. And in some cases, investing in, in ways where it may not require as much capital for me. So for example, right now, one of the investments, and I've got a, a partner in it, one of the investments we purchased is the one that's in front of a park. Uh, that was going to be a $500,000 cash purchase. Well, that wasn't enough for what these sellers really wanted or needed. They, they kept wanting to inch it up. I said, well, if you're open to giving me terms, meaning that I'm going to keep paying your loan payment, which is a 2.5% interest rate and cover your expenses, well, then I could offer you as much as 30,000 more for the purchase of this property. 
But now that means that I'm just paying your payment and you're not getting all your capital out of it. You're a couple hundred thousand of capital or 150, 200,000 capital. That allowed me to purchase a, an investment property with 50 to $150,000 less upfront, which meant that was less money that I either needed to come out of my accounts or borrow from, from private investors. And that was less money I was going to spend on fees for a hard money loan, all of it. And so then I could just focus on the capital that was going to be put into the property to renovate it and the capital to, um, to, to debt service it during that time period, which I basically de-risked a huge amount of the, that property. And that came from learning through going to some of these events, though, to be fair, like you can learn all that same stuff on YouTube and, and pick it up so you don't have to travel for it. But there was definitely an advantage there. So when I looked at the restructuring and rebuilding, I knew that like my whole purpose of getting like this big lump sum was to be able to have investments for passive income. And so then I just go back to how can I stack passive income? And for me right now, the best sources of passive income is um, rev share, which uh, through the brokerage, because I don't have to do a lot of heavy labor on that. I do have affiliated services through real estate team. My most personal successful year in real estate was in 2021. I personally sold 46 million and my team sold another like 34 million on top of that. So I made a lot in commission dollars. But what I realized was that like I, I sold a house for five and a half million dollars and it was a referral that I got from a friend of mine. And that commission, which is like $140,000 significant commission was less money than I made on doing one of the flips that closed like a month later. And that flip was way less noise. And what I learned was that whenever I can control something and I actually enjoy doing it, um, like I encourage my clients to all do kind of like mini flips on their properties to maximize their return. Yet a lot of times you just cannot convince somebody to do it. They can't see that painting, painting his office from like an old wood color and, 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 uh, and paneling to like a modern color is going to make a big difference. Um, if I'm in control of that, it's really easy for me to have my pulse on the market and be like, you know what, we're going to do better if we paint this and we tear this out and we do this. And so I did not get away from the, the real estate sales by any means, but I definitely have, have more of an eye out at all times for the opportunities that I can control how it happens. And then of course, looking for ways to, um, Anytime you have a sign of success, and you've been a big encourager of me on this, Anton, is sharing that with people, especially people who might want to partake in that. Yes. It's amazing how when you um, when you hit a home run, everyone's like, "Well, can I be part of the next home run?" And and so it's just a matter of then presenting them with an opportunity where it's like, "Hey, this isn't going to be a home run for you, but this is going to be a solid double because you're also not taking on the risk and everything else. I'm I'm taking it on and doing it, and you're investing capital." And so. That's where my focus has been is like, first and foremost, number one is on my family. And all of this was going to be happening for my family. My oldest is 15, my middle is 13, my youngest is 11. And what seemed like this way in the distant thing that I wanted to have all this revenue and capital to be able to have these experiences, only now the time to have those experiences is fleeting. And while if you ask my kids, like, what's their favorite vacation, they almost always go to the one where we spent like 1500 bucks a night on this insane place in, in Playa del Carmen. The next closest is one that was like 150 bucks a night. So <laughs> it's, it, it, you don't have to hit like huge home runs or, um, I mean, I grew up the third of seven in, in a super low income family that didn't take any vacations. And so it's more a matter of like, where are you investing that time in a way and helping them, helping, helping mold them into good adults. And so if I can do that, number one, I know that I may get tired. I'm 45 and yeah, in my mind, I want to retire at 50 and maybe that's going to get pushed out more. Um, yet, um, I know that I have the time to make that up. I do not have the time to make up with my kids at home though. Amen. Um, I know that like me leaning into my relationship with Julia, my wife of, uh, we got married in 2007. We're almost at our 20 year mark of knowing each other and, and dating. And um, I know that there's so much value in that relationship. And the times that I didn't see that was almost always the times that I didn't see value in me. And I was looking for third party validation. And the person close wasn't giving me that validation in a way that I could hear it and receive it. Yet I also know that the best investment I can ever make is the investment in that long-term relationship and the equity that we've built. And also if I don't make that investment, not only am I losing a best friend and I'm losing a one of my longest term relationships, I'm also losing 50% of my net worth. <laughs> yeah. And and that's real. And, and, and so 
When I talk about rebuilding, it's, it's first and foremost, it's got to be with the relationships that matter most. Second is something that I haven't been great at and I'm getting better at is that's the physical health. And that it's amazing how if you don't physically feel well, mm. and the times that I was losing money, I was staying up until four in the morning constantly, like reading charts and doing stuff. I wasn't sleeping well. I didn't have a clear thought process. There, there, there felt like there was urgency to make decisions that that weren't necessary. And so physically feeling better, it's amazing how you can see more positivity in life yeah. or even when things are challenged, it doesn't feel like quite as much of a challenge when you're not exhausted. Um, and then after that, it's leaning into the things, like I mentioned, that I can control at a, at a higher level. And even if I don't have to be the person to control it, I can step in in a real way to impact it. I want to go back for just one second here because mm -hmm. you said something that's brilliant. I want to I want to double click down into this is I had a seller and they wanted a very specific amount and my cash offer was lower. But I, I slowed down and you got into what was important to them. And what was important to them was apparently the number, not the term, mm -hmm. but it was the number. So if the mm -hmm. number is important to them, you then create an opportunity for both you and the seller to achieve the number and de-risk massively the situation while creating upside mm -hmm. potential. How did you mentally work through that or like walk us through part of that conversation because that's brilliant. And then also, you know, for the, the listeners, one thing to understand is then if he's only putting in 20% or a third of the capital into this deal, that opens up two to three more deals as possibilities in the background. So dig into that with me just a little bit deeper because uh, uh, you warmed my heart of coal, bro. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, so that that's 100% uh, what I started looking at, Anton, is that so when they, and this was probably like a five, six week conversation with these sellers back and forth, they were short on capital. They took a hundred grand out of their HELOC and they spent it all on like expensive furnace and contractors who did a terrible job. Like we had to rip out all the floors that they had installed in and um, just cause they did such terrible work and low quality materials. And so when I looked at what they needed, they needed bills off their plate. They needed the ability to move to where they wanted to move to, which was Arkansas. And when I asked them, I was like, do you need this money right away? Or if all your expenses related to the house are gone, would you be able to make this move knowing you're still working, you still have your jobs, you can work remotely. And would you be able to, like, would you be comfortable renting a place for a while before you bought down there? And they were like, yeah, we don't know the place anyway. We're going based on advice from a friend and like a quick trip. So like we're planning on renting anyway. So I was like, okay, let me get back to you with what I could do if we took over your payments. And they were like, so we wouldn't get any like cash up front. I was like, well, we can negotiate that potentially. Um, and we did actually do a $10,000 deposit that was released to them so that they did have some working capital to work with. But then what I did is I looked at, okay, how much capital do I need to come up with? And I had another hard money loan out already. And in my experience, the more hard money loans you have, then they want a little bit more like equity in there. So the, the people I've been working with, they were like, you know, we'd like to see 20% down payment on this and then we can give you pretty, pretty good terms, but it was still going to be roughly like 1% payment per month. So about a five or $4,000 a month carrying costs just for the, just for the interest only. And then I was going to take that hundred thousand dollars out of an account that was earning five plus percent interest and, and just sitting in a fidelity account. And so I looked at like, okay, how much interest money am I going to lose by depositing that money? How much interest expense am I going to have to take on by doing this hard money loan. And then I looked at what their monthly expenses were going to be. So if I used my own capital and did all of it with a hard money loan, then in, in essence, I was going to be taking on roughly, it was going to average out to about $6,500 a month and not including like the other like servicing costs, but $6,500 a month of outgoing um, based on interest I was losing and interest I was going to be paying. And by taking over their payments, I was going to be spending about like 2,800 or it's like right around $3,000 a month. And so there was like, and this was expected to be about a six month turn time from beginning to end. And so right there, if I'm looking at like, okay, so if every two months I've got $7,000 and we're estimating six months conservatively from the time we close to the time we close, well, that's, that's 35 thing in math. No, that's $21,000 in, in interest spread there that uh, I was going to save. And then so how I came up with the 30 number, I was, I was like, you know what? I also am getting additional opportunity because I have an extra $100,000 that I don't need to take out of my pocket. And I actually asked them. I was just like, hey, 
I know if I don't use this, the, the normal funding solutions that I use, I'm going to save a chunk of money. I'd be willing to basically you guys are being the bank then. So instead of me paying this bank, I'm paying you guys. And I was like, what's that number that would make sense? And I had actually offered them right off the bat, like that 21 or I think at 25,000. And they came back with, they're like, you know, our heart's really at 30. If you could do 30, we'd, we'd sign this and do it. And, and then I thought about it in my mind. I'm like, you know what? Like, and then that's now that freeing that extra hundred grand up has allowed us to secure another property. And then we've got yeah. another one in the works um, that potentially wouldn't have happened. Maybe they would have with more risk and more exposure, but potentially they wouldn't have happened. And so that was my thought process behind it. And, um, it's kind of like, if you know, to ask more questions and you know that these are options, it doesn't mean you can just shove it down everyone's throat and get it yet for the right people, then you can ask the questions and kind of guide them. And would you be open to this kind of a situation? And if they are phenomenal, it's a, it's a, it's a great way to do a win-win. So. Yeah, there, there are tools in the toolbox that you can pull out. Not all tools work for every situation, but if you know how to use the tools, it creates more opportunity. And so bingo, uh, that was able to create more opportunity. And let's go back to family mm -hmm. for a second. I call my homie, Steven. Steven, bro, are we going to get an Airbnb? Where are we staying? This is going to look beautiful. Steven then says, bro, I'm not going. And I say, I say, why? Why? We're supposed to hang out. We're supposed to have steak. You know, mm -hmm. we're supposed to learn, share notes. Mm -hmm. And he goes, I'm staying home and mm -hmm. I want to be present for my family. And I love when you said that. And I know we touched on this, but I, I want to touch on this one more time because I think as I think as men, I think as entrepreneurs, at times we get stuck in this rat race and we start building mm -hmm. and then we're building for the sake of building instead of being present or connecting at a high level. So I dealt with my rejection. I went and cried, but after I was done crying, I, I want you to share the rest of the story. Yeah, that's awesome. It's on. And yeah, I, I, we will have steak dinners again, my, my bro. And uh, we'll share like a fun Airbnb again. Um, and so how it came down was um, there was a big part of it that was a choice. And there was actually a big part of it that I would say is like, it wasn't really a choice for me because when you sit down with your, your spouse, and your spouse is saying, if we keep going down this path, um, it's going to be okay if you maybe don't come back to our house. And when you have children who are like, oh, you're gone this week again? Okay, well, later. And it doesn't even necessarily affect them anymore. I blatantly saw the signs that, um, that I, I wasn't abandoning my family because in my mind, I was doing everything in my power to support my family. Yeah. But it meant that I was doing exactly opposite of what they were asking for. Yeah. And my wife is a big quality time person. Julia loves quality time. What's funny is I'm a, like we, we actually went through a, a marriage course again recently with some friends through their church. And um, so we took the test again and I came back, my highest is words of affirmation, which is kind of funny because I don't give an F what like 95% or 99% of the world thinks, but the certain people that I care about or that I respect or that I look up to, I very much care what they think. Amen. And so we were in this situation where my wife was expressing to me how disappointed she was that I was leaving and how painful it was. And yet what I was getting with going on some of these events was I was getting a lot of positive affirmation, those words of affirmation. And I was depriving my wife of quality time and depriving wow. my kids of quality time. And so I think it's, so one of the most painful things anyone can experience is having to go down the mental planning steps of what it would be like to be a single dad, to be a single parent. Like, That's rough. and I pause there because it like really like it still tugs on me because that I started going down that thought process because when you and your wife have a serious discussion about it in that uh, like you're not present for us and it's not necessarily changing. Like you keep promising that it's going to, you're going to have more time. You're going to have more time. You can do this. And it's not. And so I really was presented with an opportunity to actually listen to what my family was saying. And it took having like a little bit of a slap in the face or a kind of a big slap in the face to then realize and really start um, looking at the examples and the times, looking back at the text messages, the calls from my kids, from my wife on was I leaning in and knowing that like at the end of the day, like real estate and all the things that we're working on, it's a constantly evolving machine. I mean, there's going to be players that come in and out of it and it's like jumping on a roller coaster and, but you can choose to, to get off whenever 
whatever makes sense for you. And uh, I just knew that like, while I was going to be getting off the roller coaster of the events and all of this, uh, a lot of positivity and a lot of learning, but I had such a treasure trove or chest of, of things to learn and implement that like I'm throwing things on the fire. It's like that, that standard, like I'm trying to throw so much wood on the fire. It's just barely staying alive instead of pulling a ton out and simplifying. And so it was an exercise in simplifying and really focusing on what made the most sense. And we spend so much time in sales and as leaders asking better questions yet. So often we are not asking ourselves those same questions. So yeah, I hope that that kind of makes sense because that's what it was. It's like I had to ask myself those same questions. And when I really did it at a high level, it meant that I had to tell a lot of really good friends like you, hey, we're not going to see each other in person for a while. What I will say is I am immensely proud of you because the man who sees his own faults, admits them, and is willing to make changes and sacrifice is a man that I want to be friends with. So Stephen, where do you live? Where do you do business? How can people get a hold of you? Things like that, sir. Absolutely, brother. So I live in uh, I live in Denver, Colorado. We're technically the Denver Tech Center, which is on the south side of the city. And uh, we do business all across the Front Range, which is basically from Fort Collins down to Colorado Springs, and in Summit County, which is those ski resort areas. You can find me on, uh, if you you just Google Stephen Pilkington, I actually come up pretty high. It's it's like at the top. It's my kids were pretty funny about that because they came back from school one day and I was one of the only parents that when they Googled the name, I was actually came up in the images. You find me on LinkedIn, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook. I'm not great at always responding to the messages there. Um, so you can uh, just text me or, or shoot me an email. You can actually find that on my website. Awesome. Thank you for coming, Stephen. We appreciate having you today. Thanks, bro.